So here we are, back with the antiques in the Cairo Museum, the things from King Tut's tomb. This trumpet found in Tut's tomb is considered the oldest playable musical instrument in the world. The thing on the right is a brace that was inserted inside it when it wasn't being played to keep it from getting bent or broken. Since it's playable, there may be an actual recording of what it sounds like somewhere, but in lieu of that, we'll hear what Michael Atherton's version, based on the original, sounds like. It's thought that it was the kind of thing more suited to signaling troops in battle or maybe blowing on New Year's Eve than to playing the Haydn Concerto, so Atherton has added some martial background to his performance. And here's Tut in action scattering Nubians before him on the so-called hunting chest. And here's the chest again with Tut now trampling his enemies from across Sinai on the other side. These fellows are always represented as heavily bearded. You can't make them out very well here, but they are, and the Egyptians never wore beards. There were dozens of alabaster vases of one kind or another and containers of various sorts in the tomb, some of which you see here in the Cairo Museum. Notice that the one on the right is made in the form of that papyrus lotus symbol we've seen before. One of the finest things in this category is the so-called perfume bottle in the shape of an antelope you see now. It may be a perfume bottle, but some think many of these containers held a narcotic made from the lotus and that this drug was the main thing sought by the tomb robbers. As far as I know, chemical analysis of any residue left has been inconclusive. This is called the wishing cup because the inscription on it says something like, may you always get what you wish for. There were several so-called shrines of one kind or another in the tomb. This one was apparently supposed to have a statue probably of Tut inside it because there are emplacements for the feet of a statue but no statue. There was also a large shrine which held the jars containing King Tut's internal organs. This was guarded by four goddesses, one of whom you see here, known as Selket, or the scorpion goddess, after the stylized scorpion on her headdress. Here you see the door of the shrine with Isis herself on it. According to Egyptian tradition, Isis and Osiris were both siblings and married to one another. They had a wicked brother, Set, who killed Osiris and scattered his body parts along the Nile. Isis then found the parts, including the head of Abydos, and put him back together again there, well enough to rule the dead at least, if not the living. Their son Horus then killed the wicked Seth. In life, Pharaoh is identified with Horus, in death with Osiris. The role of Isis in this story led her to be regarded as the agent of resurrection, and as such, she remained highly regarded well into Roman imperial times, and there were shrines in her honor throughout Europe. Isis and Mithras, about whom we'll hear more later, were two of the main foes of the Christians and promised much the same sort of thing, a reward in the hereafter in exchange for adopting certain attitudes and leading a certain kind of lifestyle as a mortal. These daggers were found in Tut's coffin wrapped with the mummy. The one on the left is in fact the oldest iron implement ever discovered in Egypt, and it certainly would have been of more value in a fight than the one on the right, which is 22 karat gold and could be bent with your bare hands. 
The coffin also contained dozens of pieces of fine jewelry, including this necklace. The Egyptians regarded the scarab, or dung beetle, so highly, the ones here are made of lapis lazuli, which was as valuable as gold, and in fact called blue gold. It had to be imported all the way from Afghanistan. Because they associated it, the dung beetle, by a truly prodigious leap of theological hermeneutics with such things as resurrection and rebirth. They saw how the scarab buried its dung ball and how new beetles then sprang therefrom. They weren't very good observational biologists and they thought that scarabs were in effect autogenetic. They apparently didn't know or care by the time the scarab had become an important religious symbol that eggs were laid in the dung. This all led them to associate the process and the beetle itself with the highest aspirations of religious life. No insect has ever achieved a more exalted symbolic stature. This pectoral, so-called because it was worn against the pectus or chest on a necklace, displays the scarab with some of the attributes of Horus in a way not uncommon in Egyptian art. As I think I've said before, the Egyptians often combined symbols associated with various gods to represent various theological concepts, the exact significance of which, if it's even proper to speak of something like the exact significance of uh, such things, is often now a matter of controversy. Above the scarab here is the symbol known as the left eye of Horus, which was identified with the moon, and above that you can see the crescent moon itself, with its horns pointing up around the dark part, which the Egyptians obviously knew was still there, even when it was not illuminated. Between the horns we have Tut in the center, with Thoth, sometimes called the moon god, on the left, after whom he was named and Ra, the sun god, on the right. The vegetables dangling from the bottom include the ubiquitous lotus in blue and gold. Here you see two more necklaces. The scarab is often shown pushing its dung ball, as it was on the first necklace we saw. Part of the importance attached to the scarab was due to the fact that the Egyptians viewed this as roughly analogous to the way Ra rolled the ball of the sun across the sky. The dung ball is often made of carnelian as it is here. The Egyptians had no precious stones like rubies or diamonds or emeralds. This bracelet has the right eye of Horus on it. According to the Osiris myth, when Horus killed Seth, he lost his right eye in the fight, and it came to be associated with self-sacrifice and filial piety. Like the scarab, it became popularized as just a sort of good luck charm, eventually to be dangled like the onk from the keychains of hippies in the 60s. Here you see the scarab on a bracelet with another bracelet decorated with an amethyst that is said to be the most valuable single stone in the collection. Another of the finest items is this scarab bracelet with its top scene reflected in a mirror here. The Egyptians are primarily famous, of course, for their big things. Remember, Herbert Muller calls Egypt uh, the land of whoppers, but they have hardly ever been surpassed as jewelers on a very small scale either. There were also about a dozen rings buried with the mummy. Most gold the Egyptians used probably came from Egypt itself, though much also probably came from Nubia in the form of tax and tribute payments. Apart from what was found in Tut's tomb, most other Egyptian jewelry we still have would fit in one big cabinet in a museum. Tons of it has just been recycled over the centuries, and since no one ever throws gold away, if you're wearing any gold jewelry, it may well contain a few grains from something once worn by a pharaoh. This is the gold coffin itself now, which weighs in the neighborhood of 250 pounds. Tut wears the Nemset headdress, which like the so-called Beard of Osiris, 
was typically worn in posthumous representations, although these things were sometimes also worn in some other circumstances. For example, when Pharaoh was represented in the presence of a god or the symbol of a god. Here you see the upper part of the coffin more dramatically lit. Tut also carries the attributes of Osiris as the ruler of the dead after his, his own death. The crook and the flail, these are, which are thought to represent his power to both nourish and punish his people. If every pharaoh got anything like as much gold as was found in Tut's tomb, it must have been truly an endangered metal by the end of the New Kingdom. Here's the gold mask which was over the head of the mummy. Death at an early age was certainly not uncommon in the ancient world, but some think that Tut was murdered while still in his teens, possibly by I, who had served as regent and may have been unwilling to give up power. Here you see a closer view of that mask. In an attempt to maintain their position, supporters of his widow, Rakas and Amun, as she was called after the return to Thebes, apparently arranged, although there is controversy about how all this went, apparently arranged a marriage between her and Zanenzaj, son of the Hittite king Shupaluliumesh. And I must admit, that's a name I always look forward to saying, Shupaluliumesh. But his son Zanenzaj died en route to Egypt, and it's commonly thought he was murdered, perhaps by agents of I. In any case, I was recognized as the new pharaoh, and when he died without children, the army commander Horemheb became the last pharaoh of the great 18th dynasty. The first important pharaoh of the next dynasty, the 19th, was Seti I, who built the so-called Tomb of Osiris, the Osirion at Abydos, about 75 miles north of Thebes. This is where Isis, according to Egyptian religious tradition, had found the head of Osiris and where she had reassembled him. As I said, this is called the Tomb of Osiris, but no one knows what it was really for. It's an archaeological nightmare now because the water table has risen to the extent that most of it is flooded. Seti I also built a temple named after him at Abydos, and you see it here at the top of its impressive staircase approach. It is another one of those buildings that really does look remarkably modern. Despite this look, however, the decoration inside, though some of the finest in Egypt, is very difficult to understand. Here you see Seti himself at the entrance. As I mentioned in the last lecture, Tutmose III left an Egyptian empire stretching all the way to the Euphrates. But after a couple of generations, the pharaohs lost interest in this. Amenhotep III just wanted to build things. His son Akhenaton just wanted to meditate in the desert. And Tut was just a boy. Seti I was the first pharaoh in a long time to make a serious attempt to reestablish control over this former empire and was reasonably successful. Here you can see Seti inside now as Osiris with Horus behind him. In addition to the crook and flail, Osiris often holds the so-called Was Scepter, W-A-S Scepter, sometimes held by other gods as well, like uh, Amun. It is said to represent prosperity. Margaret Murray, who devoted most of her 90-year life to Egyptology, nevertheless didn't like Egyptian sculpture. She called it cold and soulless. That seems a little harsh, but it is, as I've said, almost completely devoid of emotion or expression, so it's easy enough to see what she means. A lot of critics like this expressionless sort of work, though. The temple is divided into chapels for Osiris and six other gods, though there are representations of many others as well. Here's Kanum, who is sometimes identified with Osiris. 
He's called the creator God because he is said to have made man on a potter's wheel. And it looks like he's being presented with a new little kiln-dried soul right now. What the whole significance of release, reliefs like this at Abydos is eludes most commentators, even those who can nominally read the hieroglyphics. As I've said, even when we can read religious language, it, its meaning is often hard enough to get. In the beginning was the word. What does that mean? All creation is just part of one long run-on sentence with no period? Or does it have a period? Or a question mark? Here we see Seti making an offering to a god. Despite the spiritual content often attributed to Egyptian religion, it often comes across as pretty mercenary in the manner of much religious practice throughout history. I'll give you a plate of cakes and fruits if you'll let me win the lottery. It's that kind of thing. We're going to see some more of the reliefs in Seti's temple while we get another chance to hear in a little more detail one of Michael Atherton's reconstructions of Egyptian music. The text here is actually a hymn to Osiris, and we'll get a chance to listen again to what the ancient Egyptian language may have sounded like when it was spoken or sung. And we'll also take a quick look at the tomb of Seti I in the Valley of the Kings. Like most tombs of the pharaohs, it's gigantic compared to Tut's, which is near it, but it's far, far more impressively decorated. Unfortunately, there was nothing in it when it was opened. This is the pylon in Luxor now, built by Seti the first son, Ramses II, around 1250. It's at the west end of the temple, begun by Amenhotep III a century earlier. We saw part of what he built uh, last time. Ramses was one of the greatest builders in history, and Breasted calls him the first American. Not so much to flatter him, though, but because Breasted says everything he built was big and in bad taste. A pylon is like a kind of gate. And in fairness to Ramses, this would have looked less clunky when it was all new and brightly painted, of course. One of the original obelisks still stands here. The other is now in the Place de la Concorde in Paris. Here's one of the statues of Ramses up closer. Ramses had the longest reign, about 67 years, in Euro-Mediterranean history until Louis XIV's 72-year term from 1643 to 1715. He also apparently held the record for the number of children by a major ruler, at least of whom he kept track. He had around 300 children, probably, uh, 
among whom there were 150 sons, for a similar length of time, until this record was broken by Augustus the Strong, the famous Duke of Saxony and King of Poland in the 18th century AD, who had about 365 children of both sexes. In 1988, Kent Weeks found where some 50 of Ramsay's sons were buried in Tomb 5 in the Valley of the Kings. On the north side of the pylon, you can see represented the Hittite-held city of Kadesh, which was the goal of Ramsay's most memorable military adventure as he attempted to maintain the empire his father had reestablished across Sinai. This is described, this attack on Kadesh, the invasion of the Near East, is described. this is described here and on almost everything else Ramsay's built, really, as a great victory, but military monuments do not belong to a class of things really known for their objectivity, and most historians think Ramses, far from winning a great victory, was lucky to escape from this business alive. On this map you can get an idea of how things went. Ramses and his army were approaching Kadesh in Syria along the Iranis River, and had arrived at about the point where the arrow is, when a supposed deserter who was really a Hittite agent showed up to tell Ramses that the Hittites were scared to death of him and were preparing to flee with all their treasure to the north. If his majesty just made all speed, he might yet catch these cowards and get the stuff too. Well, when you're 20 years old leading your first big campaign, this is just the kind of thing you want to hear. The enemy is running and all you have to do is chase him down. Ramses then charged ahead up the west side of the river, stringing out his own army in disorder behind him, while the Hittites, who were in fact not fleeing at all, were coming down the east side of the river. They crossed and cut Ramses and just a small part of his force off from the main army. Here you see Ramses now on the south side of the pylon, fighting his way back to join his troops. It's fair to say that in this he did behave bravely, I suppose, but this was bravery forced on him by his own earlier foolishness. He made a vow to his horse, promising to feed him with his own hand forever if he got him out of this mess, but I doubt the horse gave that much thought. Needless to say, Kadesh was not taken, and the only victory here was at best a sort of narrow and personal one which saved Pharaoh's own skin. Here you can see Ramses now beating up Egypt's three traditional enemies, the Nubians from the south, the Libyans from across the Sahara to the west, and the Asiatics in general from across Sinai, always, as I've mentioned, heavily bearded. Despite a lot of grandiose claims, Ramses was not a great conqueror. He held some territory east of Sinai and campaigns by his armies, if not him specifically, in, in Nubia and Libya are mentioned, but no big territorial changes took place in his reign. Because of his interest in the Near East, he essentially moved the de facto capital of Egypt back north to Tanis, the so-called city of Ramses in the Bible, in the Delta. Nevertheless, most of his big building projects were in the Upper Kingdom to the south. Ramses has always reminded me a little bit of my father, like most of us, like Ramses and my father, he had his big adventures when he was a young man, and the rest of his life was never quite so exciting. So whenever there was an opportunity to tell a story, or in the case of Ramses, produce an inscription to decorate a pylon, he looked back to those glorious days of his military achievements as he saw them. According to my father, he and just a few of his friends won the Battle of Okinawa. Though, like Ramses, I think he was probably just lucky to get out of the thing alive. The temple at Karnak, which you see now, the most impressive part of which was built in Ramses' day, is just a mile or so from the Temple of Amun at Luxor, and was connected to it by an avenue of sphinxes, which we saw last time, from the Luxor end. Karnak is called the largest temple ever dedicated to a god, but it's really more of a whole complex than a single temple. 
The oldest part of it is the Middle Kingdom Shrine of Sesostris I, which we also saw last time. And this entrance pylon, you see, wasn't finished until Alexander the Great's day, some 1,500 years later. Here you can see the main part of the complex with the pylon we just saw at the extreme left. In the center is the great hippostyle or columned hall of Ramses II. And at the right are the obelisks of Tutmos I and Hatshepsut, respectively. This is the obelisk of Hatshepsut now more closely. At 97 feet high, it is the highest still standing in Egypt, though the obelisk of her stepson Tutmos III, which is in the Piazza San Giovanni in Rome, is now the highest anywhere, which is one solid stone. Uh, it's 101 feet high. Obelisks like pyramids are strange things in a lot of ways. Some of them may obelisks, for example, cast shadows that are significant, but far less study has been devoted to them than to the pyramids. Peter Tompkins, who collected most of the available pyramid esoterica in one study, also wrote a book called The Magic of Obelisks, if you're interested in pursuing this further. <laughs> Near the ob obelisk of Hatshepsut are these two beautiful pillars with the traditional symbols of Upper and Lower Egypt on them, the lotus at the right and the papyrus at the left. The ancient Egyptians apparently did not know about the true arch, at least they never used it, and judging from the example in the foreground, they weren't too good with the corbelled arch either. I think your rest in the shade of that arch might be your last one. can see now the interior of Ramses Hypostyle Hall as it looks today. In antiquity it would have been a much spookier place, roofed over like the similar hall at Luxor, with just enough light coming in at the tops of the columns to allow people to see their way around. The walls and columns would have all been decorated with imposing and scary images of the supernatural world. Rudolf Otto, in his famous book, The Idea of the Holy, argues that what led man to religion wasn't, as has often been supposed, the need to account for otherwise inexplicable phenomena like rainfall, eclipses, or whatever. Men, he thinks, were rather led to believe in the existence of the supernatural because they felt its presence, or thought they did in some circumstances and or some places like this. This kind of setting is calculated, certainly, to produce the maximum effect of what Otto calls the numinous, the feeling of an unseen presence. The largest columns ever erected are here, 80 feet high and 33 feet in circumference. You can see one of the stone lattices through which sunlight filtered into the interior. I think there's a lot to what Otto says. I, I'm not sure any great Christian was ever converted to his faith by an argument. From Anselm to Descartes, Christians tried to produce proof of the existence of their God, but I'm doubtful they made many converts. We'll get to their arguments eventually and you can see what you think. The memorable conversions are by experience rather than reason. St. Paul blinded on the road to Damascus, St. Augustine hearing tole lege, pick it up, the Bible that is, and read it, Luther terrified in a thunderstorm, that sort of thing. This is the mortuary temple now of Ramses the, the Second at Thebes on the west side of the Nile, which, uh, like many of his buildings, is criticized more than most earlier Egyptian buildings as a bit vainglorious and clumsy. The reliefs, as often elsewhere in Ramsey's buildings, are incised rather than in the more artistically impressive bas-relief medium. The 
The largest statue the Egyptians ever made was, not surprisingly, a portrait of Ramses weighing some 1,000 tons, and the remains of it, as described to him by a traveler from an antique land, were the inspiration for Shelley's famous poem, Ozymandias. On the statue is said to have been written, in Shelley's poem, that is, My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty in despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. The name Ozymandias is just a Latinized form of one of Ramsey's names, Usur Mat Re. Ramses also had the famous temple at Abu Simbel on the southern border of Egypt with Nubia erected with four statues of himself carved into the cliffs in front of it, making it look sort of like the Mount Rushmore of Egypt. Back in the 1960s, the whole temple was moved onto the plateau above the river to keep it from being flooded by water backed up from the Aswan Dam. This took an effort the ancient Egyptians could have appreciated very well, I think, even if they might have been able to do it faster themselves. At least one purpose of this temple was to impress the Nubians. Here you see one of the 65-foot-high colossi of Ramses there, and any potential troublemakers from the south might have just decided to paddle their canoes somewhere else after seeing this sort of thing. By the time he died at 89, Ramses had 500 grandchildren and probably had to mortgage the temple at Karnak just to buy birthday presents for all of them. His mummy, still with a good deal of hair, was found where those who had robbed his tomb dumped him in the 19th century. It's interesting that enough DNA survives in mummies like this for a lot of information to be gathered about cultural connections King Tut has, for example, been the focus of a lot of such attention, and amazingly, he belonged to what geneticists call haplogroup R1B1A2, to which more than 50% of all men in Western Europe belong. It is thought that common ancestors lived in the Caucasus around 7000 BC, and descendants migrated west into Egypt and Europe with the spread of agriculture. I wouldn't leave you with that picture of him, though. Here's a statue of him which was found at Tanis. And who knows, maybe Moses once saw this, because Tanis, which is called the city of Ramses in the Bible, as I said earlier, was the departure point for the Exodus. In fact, many, including Cecil B. DeMille and Walt Disney, have believed that Ramses was the Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, uh, the Pharaoh of the Exodus. The most important of Ramses' wives, Nefertari, also has a temple near his at Abu Simbel, but the most remarkable thing connected with her is her tomb in the Valley of the Queens at Thebes. It is one of the most splendidly decorated of all such things, but is only irregularly open to the public. This artist's rendition gives you an idea of the size and magnificence of it. And you have to be amazed at the amount of just labor these tombs required apart from the value of the decoration. And while Nefertari's tomb is a lot larger than Tut's, it's still nowhere near as large as many others. Here you can see Anubis on the right and Osiris, the green figure on the left, green apparently because he's associated with agriculture among other things. In back are Kepri, the god with the scarab beetle for a head, he's associated with regeneration, rebirth, etc., in the way I've mentioned before. And in back on the right, Nefertari is with Horus, identified, Horus is identified with the ruling Pharaoh during his life, so with her husband Ramses II in this case. Here's Nefertari with Isis, also again associated with rebirth, as I mentioned. And here she is, in effect, praying or reciting from texts from the Book of the Dead. That's her cartouche. 
her name in the text. What about her husband Ramses? Well, he was buried in what's called Tomb KB7, but it is a total wreck as a result of looting and water damage. Merneptah, whom you see here at the entrance to his tomb in the Valley of the Kings at Thebes, with one of the incarnations of Ra, was the oldest surviving son of Ramses and became his successor. This is in fact one of the most impressive painted reliefs in the whole valley. Most of the decoration in the tombs of the pharaohs here is, as I've mentioned, devoted to things like the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which produces illustrations that are bizarre rather than beautiful and published examples of them are hard to find. It's equally hard to find anyone willing to stake his reputation on what they all mean, and I really appreciate the fact that John Anthony West, as I've said, includes partial translations with commentary in his Traveler's Key to Ancient Egypt. If you're interested, you can get a good idea of what's involved from him, but as I've said too, keep in mind that his interpretations are considered controversial, some think that Merneptah might actually have been the Pharaoh of the Exodus himself because in the so-called Israel Stele, which you see here, he says he clobbered Israel. This is in fact the earliest surviving reference to Israel in any source. The date would be about 1200 or so BC, which is consistent with the usual view of when the Exodus might have taken place. But there are a couple of problems. Here's the actual set of hieroglyphics representing Israel, where you see the red arrow there. One of the problems with the theory that Merneptah is the Pharaoh of the Exodus is that the Pharaoh of the Exodus didn't clobber Israel. He was the clobberee, and he didn't live to tell about it. Another problem is that neither Merneptah or Ramses II is at the bottom of the Red Sea. Both were buried in the Valley of the Kings, and the mummies are in the Egyptian Museum. All a literalist has to do, though, I guess, is just to argue that the body was washed up or something like that, I suppose. The first and most important pharaoh of the 20th dynasty was Ramses III, a distant relative of Ramses II. His mortuary temple is also well preserved at a place called Medinet Habu, near where the other famous mortuary temples of the New Kingdom pharaohs are, on the east side of the cliffs, west of the Nile at Thebes. You see him here in the customary pose of the triumphant pharaoh whacking his foes as Amun assists at the right. Ramses was the only really important pharaoh of uh, his dynasty, the 20th, and many consider that the greatness of Egyptian civilization ended with his reign. He spent a lot of time fighting against various invaders, including the puzzling group known as the Peoples of the Sea, whom some think may have been Greeks. Ramses III may well have been assassinated, and Egypt did sink after his reign, into a sort of cultural darkness and irregular chaos for several hundred years. It then became the prey of others who had their flings at dominating the Mediterranean, and its history became the history of its conquerors. Libyans, Ethiopians, Assyrians, Persians, Greeks, Romans, Arabs, Turks, the French, the English. Egypt was not really an independent country again until 1952. Okay, that's the end of our visit to Egypt. Next time we'll be on the other side of Sinai in Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crescent.